I want to talk to you about two colliding and conf conflicting ideas, how we assign meaning to our self-worth and how the view of who we are is created in interactions with others around us, both offline and on, but particularly relative to black girls online. So um, I had a conflict in doing this talk. Uh, should I sing or should I talk? <laughs> See, every time I go to a social innovation conference since I was at TED in 2009, whenever African Americans appear on stage, they sing, dance, or do spoken word. So I should do something a little disruptive, right? <laughs> so let's start with a song. <laughs> Black girls singing in the dead of night. Take these broken wings and learn to fly all your life. You, you were only waiting for this moment to arise. My songwriting partner says, you make people uncomfortable with your music. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's because most of my life I've never felt safe. I've never felt a sense of my own worth as a singer and as a black girl. Um, so you forgive me, I'm a little nervous. Uh, so perhaps it's kismet. Yeah, this is so perfect. So this is the stage where I used to have some of the worst moments of my stage fright as a doctoral student in voice here at U of M. Um, I used to sing opera auditions right here, right down here. There'd be two or three people out in the audience instead of several hundred. And uh, I had difficulty, I had horrible stage fright. Mr. Um, I graduated from one of the most... <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> uh, I graduated from one of, the, one of the most prestigious schools of music in the country with a doctorate in ethnomusicology, not in voice. See, I killed that possibility before my first audition here ever began. So while I was waiting in the green room backstage in the recital hall, I did something I'd never done before. Uh, I got down on my knees and I prayed to my grandmother's soul. My grandmother had wanted to go to New England Conservatory. She was supposed to go to New England Conservatory of Music. Uh, somewhere in the 1930s, and she got married instead. So I got down on my knees, and I made a decision through a prayer. I'm not going to get in here. So please just let me have fun. So when they called my name, I got my music and walked on stage um, calmly, without fear of failing or belonging, and they asked me my name, they asked me what song I'd like to begin with, and before I could even notice, I had sung all six of the songs I had prepared for my audition. No one sings all six songs <laughs> for their audition, and I didn't even notice. It was like I wasn't there. So I bowed, they said thank you, and I felt satisfied that I had had fun, even though in actuality I was just glad that my last audition for graduate school was over. Um, I packed up my bags and I walked out of the recital hall straight into a crowd of students singing my praises. Oh, wow, you were great. And then I was scared. <laughs> what did I do? And how do I do that again? 
So for three years in my program, I felt like an imposter. A letter of acceptance came five days after my audition, and I was elated. I thought, wow, they must really have liked me. There were two conflicting ideas, two conflicting uh, consequences that happened that day before I went into the audition. First I said, I'm not going to get in here, but I did. Then I said, please just let me have fun. But for about three years, for the most part, I didn't. So what if self-worth is not our own? What if it's more like a clumsy adolescent dance we do with others that contributes to the definition of our future reputation, our future income, and our future net worth? Remember my songwriting partner said I make people uncomfortable? So I study twerking. <laughs> Awkward, right? <laughs> For 20 years of my career, I've been studying the intersection of race and gender in black cultural expressions. Um, in the last two years, I've been collecting data, over 1,000 videos of black girls twerking. That's 40-hour um, work week of twerking. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, in these videos are girls who are 13 to 17 years old and younger. Uh, I'm not concerned with the girls who are over 17. They're adults. Uh, I'm concerned with 13 to 17 year olds and younger. And what they do, particularly, I only collect data of girls who are dancing from the privacy, quote unquote, of their bedrooms. Vlogging began primarily in people's bedrooms. So there's this blurred public private sphere that happens online for a lot of people. So you can imagine I've been the butt of a few jokes among students and colleagues. And I know some of you are in the audience, maybe just a few now, are asking, what is twerking? <laughs> Wise guy, OK. <laughs> Twerking began 20 years ago. It didn't begin with Miley Cyrus. It began 20 years ago in New Orleans in the late 1980s, and it's called bounce, bounce music. It's not called twerking, although the word twerk came from a 1993 song from New Orleans by DJ Jubilee. Um, and twerk means to work or to work something or twerk it, to work something well, usually to work your body well. You bounce. Pop, lock, drop your booty <laughs> to the sound of the beats and to the lyrics. It's what I call in my research kinetic orality. There has to be a narrative. What Miley Cyrus did didn't have a narrative, a song. It's not a, it just was all tail, not tail. Okay. Um, <laughs> double wrong turn. So, um, it also was the number one Google search of 2013, what is twerking. Uh, it entered the Oxford English Dictionary as well, primarily all because of Miley Cyrus, uh, a video that she re released in 20, uh, June of 2013. Um, so the collection that I have I call the Bottom Lines Project. It's not simply, a, although it's a double entendre, it's about the digital net worth of black girls online. <laughs> When it comes to social grooming, what often happens is that men, males of all ages, um, from 13 and younger, all the way up to 40, are commenting on these videos in ways that we would call child grooming and sexual abuse. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of that. So mostly uh, males will download these videos and upload them onto their subscribers' channel and they're trying to accrue what was earlier talked about about social capital. So while you might be helping your neighbor through social capital or bonding through Twitter, other people are using social media to stigmatize. And as you know, if you've read any YouTube comments or even comments on the Atlantic's website when it comes to race, it's not cute. So there's also the matter of um, digital sex trafficking, what I call digital sex trafficking. So 
when you download and upload that video onto your site and it's a young girl under 13 or under 17, if it was on TV or radio, it would be FCC monitored. If it's on YouTube, we'll blame the girl for, up, for uploading the video herself. But most of the videos that you watch in the set that I have, uh, about almost 40% of the videos live on male subscribers' channels. So when you watch the girl, you have a, a blurred impression. You think you're watching her video when you're actually watching his video of her impression. YouTube calls these viewable impressions, and you accrue capital. You can make money, as some people know. And it's very hard today to do that, but it's very easy if you use sex or booty popping. So I want to do a little experiment. Um, I need somebody in the audience who has, look at this, uh, who will be willing to bar, uh, lend me a $20 bill just for about a minute. I'll give it back, I promise. Somebody, you have a $20, somebody up here, you got a $20 bill that I can borrow? I want to show you a little experiment about how we assign value. Awesome, thank you. Awesome. Is it real? No. <laughs> so um, I think I can do this, put this in here for a second. You know what this is? Monopoly money. It's $500. Is it more than this? No. Why not? So this doesn't have value, right? It's, okay. This has value, correct? And what do you call it? You can call it currency. What else could you call it? Cash, dough, bread, cheese, lettuce, <laughs> dollar dollar bill, y'all. I'm like, I just want you to know, like, 20 years ago when I went to school, nobody was into hip hop, and everybody was like, ooh, hip hop. And now everybody in the crowd's like, dollar dollar bill, y'all. <laughs> and that is the power of culture. So, this has value, doesn't it? I know what you're thinking. That's my money. <laughs> okay, here's this is you. You have this one. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, most of you think it's your money, but you didn't assign value to the $20 bill. That's assigned by social institutions. It's your money, but you don't assign meaning to it. Just like black girls don't assign meaning in America to what it means to be black and female. So, where am I? So online is really complicated for networked teens. Networked teens means that these individuals are in their bedrooms and they network with each other. Most young people today, that's how they get their social interaction. It is their social capital. Um, I love this quote by Dana Boyd. So how they know how to game the system on YouTube is that the stuff that gets, gets, makes profit, makes it rain, gets vet, uh, views and eyes, is grotesque, embarrassing, humiliating, and sexual. The problem with twerking is not twerking in and of itself for me. Twerking the dance or bounce music is a part of a long tradition of using the pelvic and hip regions for dancing that's across the diaspora. You can find it in any community of color in various forms. You can find twerking as dembo in Latino cultures or pereo, mapuca in the Ivory Coast, but twerking comes from New Orleans. So I'm gonna show you one twerking video. Um, this is, I found this just two and a half weeks ago. I happened to be searching to see what had been uploaded in the last week. Uh, and you'll see the title of the video is an eight-year-old twerking. This was uploaded by the eight-year-old. Uh, it took me a little time to sluice whether it was actually her video or not, given what I've told you. Um, it is, I've changed her name and covered her name, and I'm calling her Ruby. And I'm calling her Ruby after the first uh, Ruby Nell Bridges. She was the first little black girl to integrate the all-white high school, the all-white elementary school in New Orleans in 1965, I believe it was. So 
Reaction. Hello, my name is Chloe. I'm going to sweat and I'm eight years old. Let's talk. <laughs> This is one of the comments below the video. Wow, she's good. She's cute, thick, and she wasn't scared to show her skills. She just had on too many clothes. Let her twerk in her panties so she can really show off. If you kick me, kick is an app. Uh, it's actually been recognized as one that deals with a lot of sex trafficking, uh, sexual abuse with, with minors. Um, and he leaves his user profile name so we can talk. Underneath the videos that I have, 40% of these videos have this kind of comment. They're grooming girls to take off more clothing. They're grooming them to, men and boys give their phone numbers for them to call. So they're like call girls in reverse. You don't call an anonymous number, you give the number to an underage girl. It's really not safe online for girls, but particularly for black girls, in my opinion, or Latino girls. This is an example of why it might not be safe in the future. This was just a few months ago. Uh, a 73-year-old white Canadian uh, drama teacher lost her job for something that she did 50 years ago when she decided to move to Paris. She did some films that had nude scenes in them. The video surfaced a few months ago and the, the school that she worked for said, we can't keep you, sorry. The United States doesn't have a right to be forgotten law. Uh, in Europe, it's pretty common practice that you can't lose your job for something you did 20 or 30 years ago. Um, that's something we should work on. So what do you think is gonna happen to black girls? This is one of my favorite quotes from Dr. Martin Luther King that most people don't refer to. He talked about the way that we are schizophrenic about our dreams, whether he was talking about democracy and Christianity, but we could be talking about myself at my audition or young girls who don't know the cost and the risks of uploading a video from their bedrooms online. For me, I was in a private little old green room and I said something out loud. There are no videos, there are no recordings of my prayer or my audition, but it did impact me. There were consequences. This is very different and it speaks to how I began. Your self-worth is not your own. It's shaped by the interactions you have with others. In my data set, there are 31 million views. That's hundreds of years of hours watched for black girls, leaving comments for a thousand black girls in my data set. This is something that really needs to be addressed. So I wanna leave you with a quote. Um, Belief is the demi cadence, which closes a musical phrase in the symphony of our intellectual life. When I made that decision at that audition, I closed off that I was capable of singing. I decided that I couldn't win or that I didn't belong. Imagine what's gonna happen with black girls and what they're receiving as feedback. I got feedback from one member of the committee of the audition I was in. He told me after I left the program that it was one of the best auditions he'd ever seen. And I realized that in hindsight, I probably wouldn't have been able to hear him. I was so convinced that I was unworthy. I think that we should consider all of the communities of girls of color who need to feel worthy and that they need our protection and we should make it count. Thank you.